All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. You are at WCET's webinar on supporting career mobility for frontline learners. My name is Megan Raymond. I lead programs, sponsorship, and membership here at WCET. If this is your first event with us, please get online and learn more about the work that we do. As we go through the presentation today, if you have any questions, enter them into the Q&A box. If they end up in chat, sometimes we lose track of them, so we do ask that you put your questions in Q&A, but feel free to engage in the chat conversation in the chat window. Kim will share a link to the slides so you can follow along, and then we will record this and share it out later next week. If you want to follow along on social, the hashtag is WCET webcast. This webcast is held in partnership with our friends at Guild. And again, feel free to ask your questions into the Q&A and we'll get to those after the presentation. We have a wonderful moderator today. She's a WCET steering committee member and she's wonderful to work with. We're so lucky to have part of her time today because she's going through some pretty big reorg type stuff at her institution. So Shani, thank you so much for joining us today. As our moderator, I'll go ahead and let you take it away and I'll watch the Q&A in the chat and social. So thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. Um, so today I'm going to start off with just discussing what this particular webcast is about. And so you may have read this information, but we want to bring this back to surface in terms of what do large companies that cover tuition costs for employees expect of the digital learning programs that educate them? We also want to discuss how closely aligned the expectations and goals and needs of the working adults are seeking to grow their skill sets and career mobility opportunities. And so we're going to discuss um, what this is about in terms of innovative companies that are thinking beyond helping employees upskill into demanding roles and also how innovative post-secondary programs play a critical role in creating and expanding access to career mobility pathways. So today we hope there are three major key takeaways that you have, which is no, from sorry, first to improve understanding of what employers are looking for in education and training programs. Second, to understand these needs that can be translated and addressed in a broader educational context designed for the needs of working adult learners, especially those in frontline roles. And last, we want to learn about the trends and behaviors among institutions that most successfully engage with employer demand to meet the learning needs of our frontline workers. So we are excited um, as you see these amazing pictures on the screen and faces that are um, joining us today. So I'm going to start first with Matthew Daniel. Hey everybody, I'm Matthew. I'm a principal at Guild Education and have the opportunity to work in the area of uh, career mobility with our employer partners have been here for about two years and uh, get to work on practices inside those employers and the kinds of programs that help to elevate mobility and create opportunity for, for our employer partners and for our members and learners. Well, welcome, Matthew. Next, we have uh, Janelle. If you would like to introduce yourself. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Janelle Elias. I'm the Vice President of Strategy and Advancement at Rio Salado College. We're one of the 10 Maricopa Community Colleges, and I'll share a little bit more about our institution. But at Rio, I lead strategic initiatives and implementation, as well as institutional research and effectiveness and development and marketing. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Happy to have you. Thank you so much, Janelle. And last but not least, we have Dr. Marty Leathers. Good afternoon. Good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, pleasure <laughs> to be with everybody today. I'm Dr. Marty Leathers. I am the State Director of Workforce Development for Missouri. I was appointed by our governor in 2017, so I'm right at my five-year mark. Uh, and what I do is work closely with our post-secondary partners in the Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development to connect workforce training, labor force participation, labor, uh, as well as educational attainment uh, priorities. Delighted to be a part of this panel and this conversation today. Thank you. And the, and the fun part is they actually shared with me that they're excited to join into this conversation and we can talk about a lot of fun things today. So we're actually going to start with you, Marty. Um, share with us how are employers leveraging technology to increase educational attainment of their workers? Absolutely. So, you know, 
we like to say that the silver lining of the pandemic was that it really allowed us uh, to pivot our strategies and embrace technology and to kind of modernize service delivery. Um, we all know um, whether we are institutions of higher education or if we are employers or workforce training providers, that has been a very tough lift and there's still a lot of work to do. But what we're seeing is technology has begun to democratize access really for uh, skill development, lifelong learning, access to credentials, and access to education. We see now that individuals have opportunity to not only choose between do I go to school and earn a degree or a certificate or do I work, but now you can maybe do that uh, more easily at the same time. Uh, we also see more training programs being embedded in the workday. And so employers are understanding that because technology is increasing access, maybe somebody can take a Coursera course uh, or a you know certification course from another provider that um, they might spend an hour of their workday on over a five week period and then they gain proficiency and maybe even certification in a few areas. So we love the idea that technology is just increasing opportunity, it's increasing access and you know just kind of this democratization of, 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 of learning platforms. The other side of it is um, looking at content, right? And so I think it's allowing uh, traditional providers of content like our community colleges uh, and even some of our high schools uh, to provide um, you know web-based online um, platforms. And, and this is also allowing uh, uh, really some partners to be able to deliver training in areas that they haven't been able to before. So we're bringing populations really together in ways we haven't been able to in the past. Thank you. And actually, one of the things that you mentioned in terms of uh, how to serve, you know, populations, and I know for Janelle, could you speak to what Rio has learned about serving unique student populations? Sure, I do have some slides if I could frame some of uh, Rio's history and how the students we serve. Uh, we were actually founded as a college without walls, so we're a pretty non-traditional community college, meaning that we've always been innovators in distance education. Even before the internet, we were doing um, correspondence education, and that allows us to increase access and equity to higher education to historically underserved populations. And some of the students we serve today are online, but also we have the largest adult basic education program in the state of Arizona. We serve in high schools across the Maricopa County in the Phoenix metropolitan area. We also have the largest incarcerated program in the Department of Corrections in the state of Arizona. So in addition to being able to meet students where they physically are at to attend school, um, we're seeing growth in incumbent workforce, right? So if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, we were well positioned to serve this population as a community college. To Marty's point, most of our learners are on average age 28, 29 years old. They're often working adults. They're typically coming to Rio part-time. So it's gonna take them multiple years to complete a two-year associate's degree. We uh, are recognized as a Hispanic serving institution but because we've been at this for 40 years, we have over 130 programs online, 600 courses, and we're really partnering closely with workforce here locally in the Phoenix metropolitan area, but we're also seeing national expansion with large corporations that want to provide tuition assistance benefits for their incumbent workforce. So um, you might have heard the term new majority learners. I learned that from Ed Design Lab as we've partnered with them in one of our strategies to bring more micro credentials or short form learning opportunities to this particular adult working population. Slide please. Um, you are probably well aware that we have a lot of wealth of data that shows the added lifetime value of a credential, right? Even an associate's degree can get to um, higher wages throughout the lifetime of, a, of an adult. And so we know now that even skills building or micro credentials that are smaller than an associate degree, a certificate of completion, we also that can help increase earnings and job mobility as well as economic out outcomes. We also have a lot of history with designing our curriculum to be stackable where there's a certificate that leads to an associates that will then transfer and ladder up through 
this higher education career. So being really mindful to design work and learn pathways, but helping learners to understand even a certificate could lead to upskilling and reskilling and higher wage income across the lifetime of your career. So that's um, well known. And then on the next slide, we did some local research, but what was interesting is it also mirrored what, was, what we were seeing nationally from researchers like McKinsey Group, for instance, that there's this need for hard skills. They tend to be in the IT, sales, business operations and management space. So this is from a survey we conducted with the Tempe Chamber of Commerce as original research, but it perfectly aligned to what we were seeing nationally from McKinsey's research. And then soft skills is probably a misnomer, but it is their critical job skills, independent of what career field that someone chooses, communication, decision-making, leadership, teamwork, adaptability, right? These skills, this emphasis on skills, I hope we explore a little bit more in our conversation today, but we're hearing loud and clear that employers aren't necessarily requiring a two-year degree or a bachelor's degree. Um, sometimes it's just that demonstration of a skill, or sometimes it's something smaller that we're calling a micro-credential that can lead to gainful employment. Slide, please. And then, Shani, to get at your students that we're serving. You know, we've been serving that older working adult student. We know that this particular workforce, incumbent workforce population, they want to build their resume. They often want to increase their earnings. They want to grow within their, their company. We see students coming to take a course. We see them coming to take a micro-credential or an associate's degree. They want to build their skills. And here's an example of a learner with JBS, and that's the country's largest meat processing company, and they're a highly diverse workforce. They actually speak six languages inside of their workforce, and we can talk about some of those challenges. But this um, student testimony just shows that she wanted to take an HR course to get the skills to better advocate for her team to get the resources they need to get the job done. And then, of course, as a community college, we often see the learners motivated by being a first generation college graduate, being a strong role model for their community um, or their family. And then some of the challenges that we're hearing, we can talk through more, but for this population, time is their ultimate currency, right? And they're very um, mindful of how they're gonna allocate their time. So they choose Rio because we have a synchronous learning platform where it's very self-directed. A student can go online whenever they have time. They're still running into some issues with technology and laptops and internet access and paying for textbooks. And we're seeing some of these large global employers that their students might not be ready even for college level work. So we're getting greater demand for high school equivalency, GED online. What are we doing for English language learning? Those are some of the more recent demands we're hearing from that population. And again, from a student perspective, navigating the financial aid process, which I'd like to explore as well, even though their employer may be paying for them to come to college, oftentimes there's a requirement for eligibility to complete that federal financial aid form, and it can be a barrier for this population. So this is what we're hearing as we've worked with this population for well over 20 years at Rio Salado College. Thank you. Excellent. I mean, you said a lot of impactful things there. I think as we talk about one of the things you mentioned in terms of living wages, and when we kind of think about that and, and what that connectivity is in terms of our higher education or, you know, our institutions is, you know, why are we bringing this particular topic to the forefront, right? Because it essentially is bringing the conversation of, you know, what is a living wage, you know, having discussions around poverty, what is, um, when we think about, you know, the hourly or what a, either a single person or a person with a family um, need within, you know, each of those areas. And as you mentioned, looking at, you know, the labor market in, in various areas to say, are we meeting the needs of, you know, our immediate environment in terms of micro-credentials or certifications or companies? So, so uh, that's a lot of rich um, pieces that you had there. And I think, you know, it's important to remember that that's what's really ultimately um, helping institutions in terms of effectiveness, as you mentioned, in, in our measurement of success. And so that actually um, brings me to ask Matthew the next question. And one of the things, um, you know, that we were talking about is, you know, wanting our students to be successful. There are a lot of things that are 
pulling at time, trying to balance full-time jobs, but also, um, you know, increasing education for opportunity. So could you share with us what you feel is a critical step that institutions uh, may need to take to set their learners up for success as they also still pursue their career opportunities? Shani, can I go to the slide? Can I share a little bit about our organization and then Absolutely. set the context to answer that question? Absolutely. Thanks, thanks so much, team. So uh, for those who may not know much about Guild, Guild is a career opportunity platform. We partner with employers uh, to help unlock opportunity for their employees to advance their education and career. And so to do that on the employer side, we, we tend to work with some of the largest and most innovative Fortune 1000 companies in the country who are seeking to grow their own workforce. Uh, PNC Bank launched today. It was a really exciting day for us, or they launched yesterday. Uh, and I got a random call about my car loan from PNC that said, do you want another account? And I said, but before we talk about that, did you start an account on Guild and have you started looking at schools? And she had, which was a really exciting moment and a, a very fortuitous moment. So uh, here's what we believe is that access is not for the few, it's for all. Uh, we don't work with employers who aren't willing to make learning available to their full workforce. And beyond that, a willingness to engineer this benefit to align with real mobility opportunities. So um, we ask our employers to lean in with us 70% of our 5.1 million eligible member population through our employers is working in frontline roles today. And so that matters because we, along with our employers and the institutions that partner with us, know that although talent is equally distributed, opportunity is not. So we're activating an ecosystem to change that. So learners um, attend these programs and Guild Certified Network through uh, partners like Janelle's institution who are making investments. The profile you saw of learners uh, for Rio is so similar to us. What, what we see as a result of that, I think is really what's powerful. If you can't tell, I get a little excited about it. So what we see is that there's something like two times higher to experience an annual role change than uh, non-learners in those same institutions, or that on average, they garner wage increases about 2.4 times higher than non-learners within the first year of the, the programs, which for us are powerful proof points that this work, as we know, as Janelle put on the screen a moment ago, that an education is still the single greatest factor in creating mobility, economic mobility, career mobility, opportunity for people. So if you wanna go to the next slide, just for a snapshot of what do our learners look like and the data here, this is where I'm saying Janelle's data um, parallels ours. They are hungry for career opportunities. As a matter of fact, in um, surveys that they report to us, 83% of those learners perceive education as the key to unlocking their potential uh, for advancement. They are ambitious human beings. They are driven. Our students, um, as students, our members know that completing these programs will open more opportunities for them. And so we connect them with strong learning partners like Rio and others um, with digital learning uh, infrastructure ecosystem, uh, a, a legacy of supporting uh, those learners. And we understand, again, echoing Janelle here, that it is a um, a variable audience. It is an incredibly diverse audience made up of, of folks who have been historically marginalized. And so the way that we support those folks is critical. We see that most are first-gen college students when they enroll. Most are frontline workers. 58% are women. More than half are parents. And uh, the racial and ethnic identities are predominantly non-white. And so that means that this workforce that we're working with um, are uh, seeking opportunity and we can be a key partner with uh, institutions like you all to help make sure that they see those opportunities. And so that last slide, just a last bit of context here, um, is that, uh, and because I want to make sure we dive into all the other topics that we have, is that there, things are evolving right now. And this is what we see continuously. If you look at the data from last year, folks are leaving their jobs at a rapid clip as a result of not feeling like they have support in their career. They don't see growth opportunities in their future, especially uh, uh, those in low wage opportunities. 63% say they would stay in their own, with their own employer if they saw an opportunity to grow and develop. And so we see employers who 
are making investments in the space and seeing retention as a result of it, and then building their own talent pipelines internally, which is really powerful. If what we have is retention, but we're not creating opportunity, then we're holding folks in the same places. So we've got to do that two-step process of both retaining those employees in institutions and at employers who are willing to invest in them, and then making sure that those doors get open with those employers to see new opportunities in the future. Skill gaps, still a challenge. Um, the same way, what is powerful is that those employees those employees want to stay with their employers. Only 14% are telling us they actually want to leave their employer on the other side of education. And so we're able to tell employers, no, this is, this is not a risky strategy. This is a, a really good strategy to make an investment. I just want to hit on the one last point, and Janelle hit on it too, is that that short form learning is taking off. Um, consumption of that short form learning is growing rapidly in our catalog. And I think what we see is the importance of the long-term credential to go with it. So we're working with institutions, even though employers aren't necessarily asking for us, we believe the right thing to do is to make sure that we are connecting those short form certificates or credentials across institutions within institutions to continue to build long term. We, we see the financial gains even in the short form. I was looking at fresh data yesterday on mobility as a result of short form and on economic increase, and it's there. It's happening. It's happening at a similar pace in the very short term to uh, starting a degree program, which is really powerful. Now we have to continue to build that into credentials for them going forward. So I, I wanted to make sure you all had that context about um, what Guild is doing. I think the really important thing to answer your very first question, Shani, is that we hear employers um, asking us, what do we do? And we say the most important thing, employers go to this place of, we've got to change every job description, we've got to remove degree requirements, and we've got to, we've got to figure out all the mappings of all the families and all the skills across the institution. And um, I spent 20 years in learning and talent development. I've got to work in, in Fortune 100s. And the thing that I say to them is like, stop, pause, just wait. Like, what are the five pathways that we can focus on where you have high demand for talent and high surplus of talent? And how do we get people into the programs in a very focused way that create those opportunities? Now, even within those programs, there need to be a lot of different dynamics. We have folks who are starting that they need their high school diploma that are starting with ELL as a focus. So we're we're seeing that there's an opportunity to build that short form, long form, form at all different points. But how do we make sure that the programs that we have are focused on places where jobs are on the other side of it and mobility is a reality? So that's one of the practices we're focusing on. Excellent. I'm excited, like just hearing all the, the connections in terms of what you all are doing. And I think you actually made a, a perfect segue to some of the pieces that Janelle's working on. And that's primarily looking at what are some of the biggest requests from business partners, right? And also, how do these employers employer programs get started? And then I also like Marty to kind of, you know, uh, come into that one as well in terms of the um, certifications uh, that we're seeing in technology specifically. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, from the public workforce system perspective, I think that we're we're uniquely positioned to kind of work across all sectors, right? We we have an obligation to support employers and their needs. We have an obligation to support, you know, training and education providers, both in the traditional and non-traditional sense. And then of course we have a very big obligation and duty to support citizens, right? Whether they're incumbent workers, underemployed individuals who are wanting to skill up, or um, if they're part of the emerging workforce. And so we kind of do that across five different um, planes here. And I think you'll see tons of intersection with community colleges. And I come from, you know, community college backgrounds so where I worked before I was here. And, you know, I strongly believe in the passion about community colleges uh, serving as the economic engines of our uh, local economies. And, and it's because they do these things, right? So the idea is like, you know, we're talking about training. Training is anything outside of, you know, a formal degree path. So if it's outside of a high set or, you know, a GED track, or if it's outside of, um, you know, maybe an associate's degree, or if it's, uh, you know, outside of, uh, you know, a bachelor's or beyond, then we're training. Training is lifelong, right? This is the continuous part. This is the part where um, even if I learned Microsoft Excel 
three years ago, there's been a number of versions that I probably need to skill up with it, right? Or, you know, understanding how I can continue to, you know, maybe I've, I've been in supervisory uh, roles for 25 years, but maybe I've never managed a remote team, you know, so there's skill sets and things that I need to be trained on, to, you know, to sharpen my spear. You know, education is 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 kind of the, you know, it doesn't go away. And then this, other, you know, this either R statement, I love Matthew, what you were saying about how, you know, let's stop trying to recreate everything. Let's focus on what we have and how we can make it better. Uh, you know, education is all about that, right? Education is going to still be the fulcrum at which the whole thing works. And the idea is how do we increase access um, both for education to, 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 to directly be engaged in um, our employment plans, but also then bringing back in, you know, the opportunity for uh, uh, educators to be, um, you know, provide insight analysis of how they can pivot where they can turn to. You know, apprenticeships get a lot of, you know, it becomes a buzzword, you know, we're very passionate, I'm personally very passionate about apprenticeships, but really it's this concept of work-based learning. And the idea is that, you know, you can earn and learn at the same time and it's flipping the module that, you know what, I can go to work and I should be able to earn, I mean, in Europe, and I'm not just talking about in, you know, intermediary and, and secondary education, but even in the adult space, this concept of, Let's, let's partner with associations and employers and let's make sure our citizens are hired and are working and then we'll cultivate them over a certain amount of time to make sure they're skilled up. You know, that paradigm is quite different than in the U.S. where it's like we expect this ready-made product, you know, to happen and it's education's job to figure it out. Well, that's not reality, right? And that's, it's, I think apprenticeships are shifting that and we're seeing that, um, you know, Missouri is proud to be you know, third in the nation for um, you know, the number of apprentices that we have. It's, it's you know, it's a 6.1 million uh, citizen state. That's a, a pretty cool place to be. But 41% of our apprenticeships are in non-skilled trades. And so skilled trades very much matter, but so does technology, so does education, so does financial services. So it's a cross sector. Um, if you kind of, you know, and in support of services, career services has come around to like, we understand that people need help to be able to stay in work and to go to school. If you're gonna be in a tech program, you wanna get the CompTIA certification, you know, the barrier that you might have might be paying for your broadband. Let's help pay for that. The barrier that you might have might mean you don't have a laptop or a tablet. Let's help pay for that, right? Let's just think about these things uh, in different ways uh, than we have in the past. If you'll kind of advance to the next slide, you'll, you know, kind of a little bit about why in Missouri we care about these things. You know, if, if our focus and our goal is, you know, helping more Missourians go to work and stay in work, and we do know, and I'm a political science guy, you know, I have a liberal arts education, which I fully believe that's really the right term for soft skills, right? We, you gain all your common skills and soft skills through the liberal arts education. So I'm a huge, 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 huge fan of that. But, you know, the true pathway really to sustainable employment and global citizenship, I, you know, we believe is through educational attainment and labor force participation, through work experience and engagement with work and through engagement with education, continuing to grow and learn. That's how we think we can build more resilient economies. And so we've measured ourselves against that. And we look at policy initiatives and investments we make in Missouri. Of how do we help more Missourians uh, access educational attainment, which is a post-secondary certificate or degree? And how do we help more Missourians go to work and stay at work? And I think that those are the things that we care a lot about and that we can actually look at tangible impact. And so we can look at numbers and say, hey, if we want to go from a 63% labor force participation rate to a 70% labor force participation rate by 2030, that means we need 312,000 more Missourians going to work. And that includes doing the math on the churn of the people who are going to retire and leave work over those years, right? So we need to be constantly bringing in that many, uh, you know, those many workers and helping those many workers stay in the workforce. Finally, if you'll look at kind of uh, how we want to actualize our goals, we kind of have a policy framework in which we do this. And this is really how we, uh, you know, think about and talk about working across all of our populations and all of our partners. This, you know, you can look at this, you can be like, wow, this is pretty obvious. And, and yeah, it's supposed to be intuitive, right? It's not supposed to be some big idea on the shelf. It's supposed to be something that kind of outlines what you do every day. And we simply understand that from a public perspective and from a workforce development perspective, we need to be laser focused on how do we have better access to quality employment opportunities. And that means defining the construct of quality. Aspen has uh, just released a really good, uh, a report yesterday where they're doing a good, you know, they're, they're, they're defining what quality means. Um, understand that quality and equity are absolutely interlinked and that you, you know, you, it, it, that you can't think of it, you know, one without the other. Understanding the perspectives and the barriers that employers have as it relates to accessing skilled talent and understanding what that means to keep skilled talent. And so, you know, 
why do employers uh, in 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 the U.S. Um, you know we we lag developed nations in in you know relative share of um, of budget that goes towards training developing our existing staff so how do we you know help companies understand that and, and, and thinking about those things and then you know um you know i talked a lot already about aligning workforce need with education and training it's it's more than just having an industry advisory council that comes together once a quarter and has 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 pizza like that that does matter that's it's great but are we actually talking about some of the challenges and are we you know co-designing frameworks and solutions around true needs and there can't be a one size fits all approach to this what you know what dallas employers need it'll be up to dallas community college to figure out right what what, what employers and mayor Cooper county need it's going to be up for them to figure out what we need here you know in in, in, in missouri um you know our community colleges are in the best position frankly to do that but so are our state and regional universities and so you know they understand what the community needs are and so understand how to deliver those in a way that honestly doesn't fit into the traditional business model of delivering you know uh education and so so understanding you know how to even fund that because um, there's there's some challenges there and then finally infrastructure and certainly we care about broadband and our roads and our bridges but our systems have to be aligned and connected our system, you know, it, it shouldn't be that I have to choose between filling out a FAFSA application or an application to determine if I'm eligible for Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act funds. It shouldn't be that I should fill out an unemployment application for insurance and benefits and still have to fill out an application for SNAP and TANF, right? And so how do we connect these things together? How do we also understand that students uh, in our universities and in our community colleges also also need the same supportive services and they need those um, you know safety net benefit programs to help them sustain themselves while they're building up for a career you know and how do we make sure that our systems and our policies don't disincentivize going to work because then you have a trade-off decision to make do i want medicaid for my family or do i want to take this job that shouldn't be something that we put in front of individuals and so thinking about the infrastructure how our systems and policies and our funding is aligned to be able to do those things so for us you know we think a lot about uh this through the lens of you know technology but it's really also about you know partnerships it's about funding um it's you know it's 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 about curriculum and content and it's thinking about you know what's out there so i love what guild's doing and i think guild's numbers are showing that you know credentials and certifications and short-term learning um you know that's how we keep people in work and then leveraging and owning some of our more traditional means are how we help prepare people for work you got to do both and i think that's the big piece that sometimes gets missed excellent i think one of the things that you mentioned um that i want to hone in is one of your quotes which which was impactful i was like the, i know this is going to be a, a great segue for janelle and it, you you mentioned increased access for education to be engaged in employment plans and opportunities for educators to have analysis of programs and I, I i love the next piece that talks about partnerships funding curriculum and content so janelle could you um kind of move into the space of how do employer programs actually get started and from that piece that he's talking about especially when you have those uh curriculum and business uh committees that are coming together to align and also what are the biggest requests that you know you see in terms of business partners yeah thank you Marty, I appreciated your comments. And from the community college perspective, what Marty said is so true that it has to be highly contextualized to the community with which is our ecosystem, right? So we work very closely with cultivating partnerships with local employers. Sometimes they're satellite campuses. And then I also have been working closely with more headquartered corporations that are national in scale, but it's really assessing their their needs. That's where we always begin in that instructional design process. That skills gap, I think that there are 90% of employers are saying they're seeing skills gaps. So we start by just exploratory conversations about what are their, their workforce demands to Matthew's earlier point. What incumbent workforce do they have? Do they need to be upskilled, reskilled, or are we talking about recruiting new talent pools for for workforce. And so we see those requests come to us directly from employers locally and nationally to serve that, that need. Um, what we've started to do is rather than 
design specific pathways to specific employers is to try to start to design more globally by industry sector. So that's an interesting experimentation where we'll talk to multiple IT um, tech firms in the Valley, and then we'll try to understand the common denominator. Can we create something that's not so custom that it only fits the needs of one employer, but it could be a pathway to for our community to gain employment to these large employers. And so more of an industry sector approach has been one level of collaboration that we're taking with the Maricopa Community Colleges. And then I would say to Marty's earlier point, we are co-creating the curriculum with employers at the table, also with students at the table. And that's been a powerful paradigm shift um, to, I think, Shani, you said it, that we're not just creating widgets and at the end they go to workforce. Like now we have to engage the employers at the front end of the curricular design process. And sometimes that's a boot camp that might last eight weeks and then get them into an entry level job with Intel. And then they continue to be cultivated by the institution and, and supported by workforce. But keeping the ongoing partnerships um, maintained is really critical so we understand the needs and that the employers in our community know that we're a resource that can be responsive to them. The last thing I'll say is in my role like as a strategic officer, just constantly monitoring market trends on where the job opportunities are. So there's so much data available to us that I often don't have to ask employers where the growth opportunities are. I can use Gray and Associate or other tools, Hanover, uh, McKinsey to understand where the job demand is. And then we engage employers in the, the co-designing and the co-creation of, of those, those partnerships. Thank you for the question. Absolutely. Um, I want to continue with you though, because I know that we're certainly talking about creating pathways and opportunities, but as we were mentioning with uh, balancing um, life responsibilities and some of the demands that um, are, are some of those personal de demands that people have and also kind of looking at, you know, work, but also school and, and often balancing all three. So Janelle, what do you find are some of the, the challenges that frontline employees face in pursuing their education? Yeah, I'll say what Rio has done really well is it was designed to be asynchronous online with weekly start dates. And that model has really helped us to be elastic and to scale. But think of how well that model matches the needs of flexibility for a working adult learner who's probably also a parent or maybe a caregiver to their own parents. So the ability to start on a weekly basis is a huge flexibility that we offer. We see higher ed institutions and other community colleges experimenting with eight week course section, you know, different course section links and and more um, start dates throughout the academic calendar. And I think that is very responsive to this population. The other thing that we've built our, our teaching and learning model to be asynchronous, it's very well suited to this learner who might need to be online at 10 p.m. after they put the kids to bed, they're just sitting down to get started on their assignments. So making everything available to them in real time, we've really bolstered our digital wraparound support so that the student knows that there's 24 seven tutoring, for example, and supports available, which technology has been able to um, help us enable and realize even more wraparounds that are not time bound. And we continue to, to seek to offer those services to these learners 24 seven. So we're also looking at our operating hours and structures of should we be operating 24 seven or how do we use technology? How do we use chat bots and AI to help bridge those gaps when we might not have workforce at the college on campus to support those learners. Again, it's a lot of that flexibility, that ability to personalize, and then the contextualization to career, which we see happening really well in both examples that Matthew and Marty shared. But when they have the employer also encouraging them with the career ladder, it really helps them to contextualize the learning in the classroom. Can, can I just add on to what Janelle said, which is, um, I think this is where that partnership with Guild in particular, we have found really helpful is um, Guild provides, again, for those who don't know, kind of wraparound coaching that exists. So on top of the, there, what we imagine is that there are places where an organization like Rio is best suited all day long to provide the support at the learner level, right? And that, that is true with any institution 
there are some institutions who have developed more sophisticated and mature models and some that lag behind in their understanding of how to serve service um, adult working learners. And so we tend to have flexible models that we're working with uh, um, learning partners to make sure that we have the right wraparound. And mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give an example of um, what some of those wraparounds look, look like, because I think Janelle's talking about context um, at the employer. I'm going to quote data. I was uh, looking at um, one of my um, colleagues' articles not too long ago. So here's what the data said. More than 80% of working adults, primarily in frontline roles that we surveyed, said they're returning to education to advance in their careers, yet half of those students aren't clear on how education will actually help them, right? So there's this deficit in understanding. And, and what we see is that for dropout rates, for those who actually drop out and don't return, there's a six-fold increase in the data on the fact that they didn't know how they were going to bridge that education into their career. So part of that, um, those career services have to be oriented very top of the experience of entering into a program and making sure that the program is the right fit for them from the beginning and is oriented both to where the market says jobs are available and uh, to where in the interest of the students or the learner exists so that that kind of Venn diagram is as tight as possible in a way that makes sure that um, they actually have the um, mental, like the the inside of themselves way, right? We have things that we need to provide on the outside to make sure that we support. You know, we have employers, I had an employer last week I was on the, on the phone with who they are not a partner with Guild yet, but they wanted to know, like, how, what is my job? How do I provide more time for my employees to consume this learning? What is my responsibility? And, and this particular chief learning officer that I was talking to was highly motivated by equity. And what she said to me is, my uh, my frontline workers. Sorry, I was trying to think of how to uh, not give away who it is. My frontline workers are are not in a position that they have spare time to go consume this. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? Right. So we have those employers talking with us, but then we need to calibrate once those. Um, learners get in to say, okay, let's make sure that this is the fit for you and where you want to go, because we see such a significant increase in retention into programs as a result of those services that are wrapped around being tailored around making that connection between context and, and the work that they're doing in the education they're pursuing. Excellent. And I like um, one of the pieces that you talked about in terms of how, how to find a place for employees to complete programs. And this is actually a general question for everyone because um, it's that investment in that pro professional development to essentially upskill, as you all mentioned, reskilling and new talent. So in some of your partnerships that you have, um, could you all speak to like some of those partnerships and how companies are building in that time or, you know, where do you find that employees are uh, able to um, really be able to increase their skills for more opportunity? I literally heard from a student this week who is waiting to use the computer in the break room. And we have to remind ourselves, this is the student we're trying to serve here, right? That they might only have a lunch break and they might not have a laptop at their home to participate and engage. And so um, we really try to work with our employer partners to make sure they're creating time and space and maybe have some of those resources available on site. So even if a student needed to dip in during a lunch break. Another thing we were doing that was innovative and I wanted to share, cause it's, we're really proud of it. We actually partner with employers who um, in their onboarding programs to help come alongside them and award credit for those training programs. So it's highly custom, highly contextualized, and the student starts to earn college credit towards that longer term career and education pathway. And in those cases, it's like the, the training department is partnering with us in co-designing, and they're actually having it built into an onboarding experience that we can then make award college credit for. And that's almost an ideal scenario where you're gonna do it anyhow in the workforce, or it's a work-based experience, and we can come alongside and award college credit for that. Excellent, anyone else? 
Okay, so I'm going to shift to Marty here for a second, and that's that's perfect to say how can this training, how can training providers better align with employers, students, and workers to directly connect educational attainment with the workforce participation? So you know, I think that's a lot of what we've been talking about, and mm -hmm. I, I think that you know, getting to concrete answers that you know, kind of show that and show how that can be done, I think um, we're starting to see. And I, I think that, so So just a couple of, you know, examples, I, I think one, it all comes down to this concept around getting the right people at the table. And and, and so um, some of what we lost in the pandemic, and I, I know everyone's tired of hearing that phrase, but is actually coming together. And what that doesn't have, it can be virtually or it could be in person, but the idea of sitting down to say, here's the issue that we've been kind of all admiring for a while. How do we help actually take action and, you know, diagnose the issue to resolve it? And then, you know, putting together an actual framework around that and whether it's, um, well, we're not getting enough applicants, you know, or, you know, it's, it's that the people that are, are coming out of, you know, the local high school or the local community college welding program aren't, you know, we have to retrain them when they come to work. Okay, let's actually unpack that and figure out what the core issue is, because I bet it's because it's not because they have bad training. I bet it has something to do with something unrelated to that, that we can actually work together to try to resolve. So I think part of it is just being more intentional about sitting down and, and working to diagnose and resolve the issues. I think the other piece of it is just, you know, going back to technology, like let's use the moment uh, and let's use technology that we have available. States and colleges, you know, um, it's not like there's a lot of, it, it's weird with the whole money conversation because there's everybody's like, well, there's tons of money, there's tons of money. Well, there is, but it's like, it's called the color of money, right? I can only use purple money for purple activities and, and, and green money for green activities. It makes it very, very hard. Um, but what, 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 what is out there though, is the opportunity for us to modernize some of our platforms and systems. And I think that, um, you know, this is happening and employers seem to be willing to kind of step up and pay for it too. Mm -hmm. And so helping guide and counsel them on like, Here's what a, you know, uh, an LMS looks, learning management system looks like. You know, we, we care about, you know, learner employment records and creating, you know, passports for badges and credentials. Like those are things that for us are, you know, things we've been talking about a very long time that might be alien to employers. So we can actually sit down and say, here's how we can help you do these things. And so um, I think those would be uh, the, the way to consider it. Great. Anyone else? That's well said. And I appreciate your perspective because you're bridging, you know, employer, workforce, um, state government, inter-government. Inter <laughs> so I, I really value that. Thank you. Excellent. All right, great. So we're going to shift. I believe we have a question. Okay, so our question looks like, let's see, on just a minute. Oh, Marty, we wanna get the reference, it seems for uh, the data you just quoted, the 80% of working adults returning to school. That actually might have been a Matthew. Matthew, was that one of your the Matthew? data points? Yeah, I mentioned, I mentioned the 83%, so that's, that is actually directly from our data. When we uh, survey our, uh, when we survey learners, when they start to engage with us, we ask questions about why are you hoping to go through this journey with us? And what we see is at 83%. So I can't answer for the whole ecosystem at large, but what I can answer for is for those who are leveraging their employer's benefits as a means, they are highly motivated uh, in terms of seeing career outcomes as, as the reason that they're pursuing it. I do, I, I will point, just because we don't have a ton of questions, if I may, I want to just tell a, a quick story. So um, when Live Better You rolled out at Walmart, that's how Walmart has branded their, um, their program. One of the things that's really interesting, there, um, I think I, I appreciate uh, Walmart came to work with us because they wanted to really ramp up 
some of their um, healthcare space. And so one of the roles they needed in, in surplus was uh, pharmacy technicians. And so we, there, there is a, uh, one of our students, his name is Ivan, and he is actually a farm tech. And I love this story because Ivan ended up going to school. He had attempted to go to school earlier. It was uh, a for-profit university where uh, unfortunately, he didn't end up, as the story goes often, it didn't end up with a credential, but did end up with that and was really paralyzed. Circled back around through Live Better You, where he got access to um, tuition free uh, uh, programs. And so, even though he's coming from a program like Farm Tech, where there is super high demand at Walmart, he actually is, is um, close to uh, heading into a cybersecurity analyst role. Um, where the where Walmart as an employer, and this goes to that problem that a lot of employers want to fix. They want to um, remove experience requirements of all of their job descript descriptions, et cetera. And what they managed to do was to find some roles where they could carve out space um, for somebody like Ivan, who's reskilling in the cybersecurity, to take a job. And so what I appreciate about that, I think that sometimes when we look at employer partners, we don't always assume the most positive intent in, in our engagements with them. And it's for good reason. We're in a capitalist society. Let's not pretend otherwise. But also what we see in this particular interaction is this very open-handed approach of saying like, you're in this area that we really need you in, but hey, here's another area and you're passionate about it. It's gonna create uh, more doors and create more economic mobility. Let's do it. Not only are we gonna do it, we're gonna help pay for it. So I think there is this really powerful story that comes with this, that, again, that Venn diagram where when the um, desires of the employee to reskill, upskill into new areas match with um, the organization, both who they are uh, trying to become in terms of being perceived as an employer of opportunity, being an employer of opportunity, and the doors they want to open in terms of jobs, it can be this really powerful uh, connection point between those two sides um, that we get to interact with on a daily basis. Wonderful. Well, I think that we certainly had a lot of great information today and really exploring the areas that we're talking about in terms of a variety of um, educational opportunities for our community and thinking about our students coming in. Um, sometimes, like we were talking about, maybe not necessarily for that two or four year degree or maybe kind of concurrently doing a two, four year degree, but also some micro credentials and some certifications. And I like what Janelle mentioned in terms of kind of that on-demand learning and what are we doing to continue to balance, um, you know, coming into our, our educational uh, um, environments. And as Matthew mentioned, you know, these partnerships that connect, you know, when we're thinking about um, how are we uh, leveraging our employers and then also internships and what are we doing to continue to pour into, um, as Ma Marty mentioned, the upskill, you know, when we talk about upskill and reskilling and how many of our um, working adults are coming into our spaces. So those conversations are very important, that dialogue to keep going, because in order for us to continue to refine what we're doing in order to service our students and how the needs are continuing to grow and develop around technology, around, you know, demands of schedules and time. Um, and, and just that, that whole balance. So, you know, thinking about our employers, uh, providing that space and those resources uh, to retain uh, their employees, but also, you know, receive new talent. So I want to thank each of you because it's been um, a great, great conversation today. And I want to transition um, to Megan. Great, thank you. Whenever I click on the question box, my my mic and video get uh, kind of lost. So thank you so much. Let me advance back up a slide here so that you have contact information for our speakers today. Thank you to Matthew, Janelle, and Marty. And thank you so much, Shawnee. This was a great conversation. I hope you all learned a lot about you know this bigger ecosystem that we are all operating in and as things continue to be more dynamic and flexible. I think there's a, a lot of exciting opportunities ultimately serving our learners. So again, if this is your first um, connection point with WCT, learn more about us and the work that we do. We 
do a lot of webcasts. We have three this month. So we have another one coming up next week on micro credentials. And we record them and put them on our YouTube channel, which you can access through our webcast landing page. And we are in the midst. Oh, here comes our exciting train through Boulder, Colorado. So mm -hmm. apologies for the noise. But our annual meeting is coming up in Denver, Colorado. We are face-to-face -face solely. So we're excited to actually see people and connect in person. Thank you to our WCET sponsors. They underwrite much of our work here at WCET and make things possible. And our supporting members, California State University, Colorado State University, Michigan State University, the University of Arizona and the University of Florida. And thank you for being part of this discussion today. Take care, everybody. Bye.